very much uh, for this introduction. Uh, so, so far, nobody has shown any slides, and I won't show slides either. It's a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to address the participants of this conference today uh, as part of the panel of digital transparency and accountability. Now, key questions that will be debated in this panel include the following. Does te te uh, digital technology, digital culture, and the possibilities they offer really transform societies and their governments, lead to better services, increase transparency and accountability? What are the benefits of digital tools and digitalization, cloud services, social media, wikis, open data, big data, data analytics, et cetera, et cetera? And what are the dangers and the lessons learned so far? Now, these are interesting and important questions, no doubt. However, before we uh, will try to collectively uh, attempt to answer them, I suggest staying for a while with the very title of this panel. Digital Transparency for Accountability. And I would like to offer you a few reflections and a number of theses, four theses on the latter. So it is now over 10 years that the Council of Europe has adopted its 12 principles of good governance. And these principles were included in the strategy on innovation and good governance at local level. And among these 12 principles, well, we also find transparency and accountability. But what exactly is meant by these concepts and who, how do they fly, if you want, in the digital age? What exactly is, to begin with, transparency? For the Council of Europe, principle number four in their list, meaning openness and transparency, means that decisions are taken and enforced in accordance with rules and regulations. They mean that there is public access to all information which is not classified for well-specific uh, reasons as provided by law. And third, that information on decisions, implementation of policies and results is made available to the public in such a way as to enable it to effectively follow and contribute to the work of the local authority. So if we now look at the challenges and the opportunities that the digital world uh, has with regard to openness and transparency as defined by the Council of Europe, we see that there are essentially two major aspects that are touched upon. First, citizens should have a public access to all government-produced information that is not classified, that is not secret. And second, citizens should be enabled to contribute actively to the work of government, thanks to this information. So, to participate. Now, the first aspect, access to information, has become paramount in the digital world. The entire open movement, open parliament, open government, open data, etc., etc., has not stopped with digitalization. On a side note, um, uh, the idea uh, of access to data for everybody is as old as libraries are old. But to the contrary, it has massively grown because of digitalization, opening, opening up a whole Pandora box of issues. It led in many places to the need, first and foremost, for administrations and public authorities to digitalize their own procedures, archives, and uh, to the way they present themselves to the wider public. Now, this is costly. It bears risks of all sorts. And in many cases, it strongly challenges the administrative culture that preceded the digital. This digitalization of public affairs has clearly followed the road of an efficiency enhancing logic. Administrations work smoother, 
They work more efficiently and generally better when their output is digitally archived, when it is accessible beyond the working place and beyond the opening hours for those who are working on that data. And at the same time, processes become more transparent, not only within the administration, but also vis-a-vis -vis the broader public. Never before could so many citizens simultaneously access public data that is of interest to them personally or generally. So there comes the legitimacy enhancing logic. And at the same time, and while the access to general information seems to be less problematic, the storage, the processing, and the accessing of personal data, not only by the state, but by concerned citizens themselves, has led to questions related to the ownership of this data, and of course, to privacy concerns. Through instruments such as the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, even the supranational level has pushed the agenda in this field much further than anybody could have foreseen. Scandals of data leaks in administration, but also of the processing of personal data stored in social networks have pushed the legislature to regulate more precisely who can do what with what type of data. And based on these observations, I, uh, I dare developing a first thesis. This process is not simply a juridical or regulatory one, but it actually becomes ever more political in content, igniting struggles over resources as access to data has become a form of ever more decisive power. There are nowadays winners and losers of digitalization, and a lot has to do with how individuals are able to deal with data, and also the one that is public or publicly accessible. And these winners and losers of digitalization will be mobilized by different political actors by political parties and movements, etc., leading to conflict in legislatures and governments, as well as between branches of the administration and even between governments themselves. Now, the second aspect, the active contribution by citizens to the work of government in a broader perspective, the participation of the citizens, is of course very important from a democratic point of view. Data is not only made accessible to citizens, but the latter actively work with data. They enrich it, they enhance, and they control it. Now, this is not an easy task, and the digital world does not make participation by citizens automatically easier. There are, however, many examples of how digital transparency can lead to better and even to more participation by citizens. Now, I'd like to give you just one of those examples that is dear to my own research endeavors, and I would like to briefly recall the spread and effect of online voting applications, online uh, voting advice applications, or VAAs, as they are called. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard of VAAs, but just to recall, they offer citizens to quickly go through a series of statements on which they take a stance. For example, nuclear energy should be prohibited. That's a statement. And you can take a stance on that. Once you have done so uh, on a series of statements, a simple algorithm matches the user's political point of view with the positions of the parties or the candidates and or the candidates that are running in an electoral campaign. And this match becomes then a voting advice, telling the user what party comes closest to their point of view. So such systems have been developed over time in Europe, and nowadays beyond Europe, and 
their success is really enormous. Millions of voters make use of such tools in the wake of an election, literally everywhere in modern liberal democracies. So by making information uh, transparent, in this case party manifestos, and accessible to the voters, these tools work like information aggregators, helping the undecided to find their way around in an ever more complex political environment. So this is the type of simplification that we were mentioning uh, this morning, not the one that, that uh, uh, Rasto um, uh, uh, mentioned, actually, these nicknames, etc., but a aggregation and a simplification of data that actually can be extremely useful. And the result of these VAAs, the effect of these VAAs, is that they actually increase interest in politics among those who use them. Uh, that leads to increased knowledge about politics, a more developed sense of political efficacy. And as we could show in several uh, academic studies, scientific studies, even to higher levels of uh, participation. So this was simply an example of how transparency can lead to more and to better trans, uh, participation by citizens in democratic processes. Other examples would include, for example, the, Rahav, the Rava Kogu process in Estonia, the Icelandic crowdsourced constitution, public online monitoring of members of parliament, and many more. Interestingly enough, most of these participatory instruments are designed bottom up. So they come from civil society, from academia, from the media, and even society in a broader sense. And this leads me to my second thesis. If digital transparency is guaranteed and enabled from the top, this can lead to astonishingly successful bottom-up initiatives, truly allowing citizens to take part in democratic processes. So let us now have a look at the second element of our panel's topic, which is accountability. When it comes to accountability, again, the Council of Europe means by this that all decision makers, collective and individual, take responsibility for their decisions. Second, it means that decisions are reported on, explained, and can be sanctioned. And third, there are effective, uh, these are effective remedies against maladministration and against actions of local authorities which infringe civil rights. So accountability as a concept, as a term, is very much en vogue for the past, I would say, 20 or so years. And this can be quite easily shown uh, by the terms proliferation, for example, in scientific contributions. The most central element, in my view, when it comes to accountability is the idea of sanctions. For someone to be held truly accountable for their decisions, for their actions, for their behavior, it does not suffice for this person uh, or for this institution to be responsible for uh, his or for her or for its decision. Most importantly, the accounter or the agent, if you want, can get sanctioned by the accountee or the principal, if you want. Or else, I think we do not really have any form of accountability relationship between the two. For example, members of parliament can get re-elected or not, with elections serving as the main mechanism for the voters to hold their account, uh, for holding their representatives accountable. Now, how does digitalization affect these relationships between accounters and accountees? Well, as in the case of participation, the basic access to more digitally available data allows the accountee to control and to sanction the accounter more easily. 
This can be seen in the velocity with which, for example, news about misconduct of any sort can spread and develop immediate effects. Now here is again a danger involved, and it is not a minor one. And we've heard it this morning, fake news and fake data can develop incredibly uncontrolled and unwanted effects, not just in times of elections, but of course also in times of elections. We have all witnessed this, and Rasto this morning has uh, been mentioning this. Although there is some kind of new type of uncertainty, of not fully knowing what is true and what is not, that clearly affects public opinion, that uh, in a sense, with this massive amount of data that citizens, media, civil society, uh, are today holding in their hands, um, for holding their representatives accountable, this massive amount of data has become very difficult to grasp. So difficult, in fact, that ironically, those same citizens, media and civil society, can easily drown in a sea of data that may not be relating the truth. So this leads me to the third thesis, accountability in the digital era has become more efficient, but vulnerable at the same time. So finally, let me uh, also have a quick look into the future where the digital will not simply remain the digital, but where other forms of intelligence will emerge and admittedly already have emerged. And that will greatly impact transparency and accountability. I'm thinking of artificial intelligence here, AI. So please allow me a short excursus into the future by asking the question of how artificial intelligence is linked to democracy and democratic processes. So let us begin um, with thinking of one of the most central areas, I'm thinking about one of the most central areas of, well, no, let me say first that I think that there are several areas in which AI and democracy may actually touch each other. The two stand in a bi-directional relationship to each other. On the one hand, artificial intelligence may well affect democracy, but on the other hand, it may well be that democracy can affect AI. Let me briefly touch upon the first causal arrow going from AI to democracy. So, one of the most central areas uh, of democracy clearly are moments in which people decide at the polls about who uh, will represent them or they decide about uh, clear policy issues in referendums. And here, AI can directly impact on voting procedures and on electoral structures. To give you an example, AI-enabled technology may help design electoral districts through algorithms that can learn from the violation of legal and political principles in order to achieve more equal representation. One can also imagine post-electoral or even real-time uh, during elections kind of autonomous fraud detection systems with algorithms learning from electoral fraud patterns from one election or from one region to the other. AI may directly impact not only on structures, but also on the actors in elections and referendums. Clearly, the most important ones are citizens, candidates, and political parties, but also media of all sorts, and those providing them should be added to this list of important actors. Artificial intelligence can greatly affect the informative ecosystem within which the public opinion formation process is taking place. And this is potentially the most important area of the electoral process. AI can be optimized to the point that voters do not even have to learn anything about politics anymore. With enough data produced by the voters, and in Western liberal democracies uh, there is quite a lot of that, 
Machine learning allows for predicting one's vote choice possibly more accurately than oneself. Such an election automation could thus lead to some kind of robotic representation. A robotic representation that would also make sure that any action by the representatives is taken into account in the calculus of any voter in the next election. I'm not advertising this, I'm just saying this is a real possibility. So in all of this, AI would be optimizing electoral processes, making choices more precisely matching voters' preferences, and making sure that the congruence between those who represent and those who are represented would be maximized. But what would one then still need a parliament for, or a government, as a matter of fact, if all of that political decision-making can be optimized through artificial intelligence, then it becomes more efficient. This is undeniable, but efficiency is often at odds with legitimacy. Such AI-optimized or even replaced democracy would start doing without the traditional chain of accountability between an accountee and an accounter, between a principal and an agent. The two would simply become one and the same, matched on a continuous basis by artificial intelligence. And in this case, AI-optimized decision-making would become accountable to itself. And such a form of reflexive accountability can only work if, and I already mentioned this before, there are sanctions that a principal can inflict on its agent. So artificial intelligence would therefore have to be optimized to sanction itself, to limit its own power. And this might not be impossible, but it's clearly much more difficult than expected. The main difficulty arises from the fact that morality, ethics, and of course emotions may strongly affect political choices. To model these emotions and ethics and values is rather difficult, but it's not impossible. But even if this becomes possible for any given political situation, this tension between an efficient political decision and a legitimate one will probably remain for quite some time. And then there's a second strand of thinking which, which takes AI, academically speaking, as the dependent variable, the phenomenon to explain, and democracy as the independent one. So we look at the impact of democracy on AI. Why? Because not all AI is white. To the contrary, there is quite some dark one allowing bots and trolls to disturb the electoral process. Also something I already mentioned and that we have heard about in the last panel. So digitalization and AI has of course also the potential to sabotage an entire election process in subtle and maybe in even undetectable ways. Artificial intelligence has the potential to completely dominate the information environment in which electoral campaigns, for example, are embedded. And who controls the information environment has quite a strong position within the electoral process. So it is probably necessary for democracies to deal with artificial intelligence, including for regulating in this field. Can AI be made more inclusive, more transparent, and therefore more democratic? That's an important question, and there's a large debate going on uh, right now concerning so-called algorithmic accountability, which is not only a buzzword, but clearly shows a perceived need for bringing the working of algorithms closer to the wider public and to its scrutiny. So this leads me to my fourth and last thesis. We need to make sure 
that algorithmic accountability can really be ensured. We need to make sure that algorithms are offering the very same accountability relationship between the people and government, between voters and the elected, between accountees and accounters. So in conclusion, let me simply state that yes, openness and transparency are necessary ingredients for improving democracy in the digital age. And yes, the same is certainly true for mechanisms of accountability. But are they sufficient ingredients? That's probably not the case. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexander. I think uh, I have a long list of points uh, out, of your, uh, out of your intervention. You raise so many interesting issues and angles um, that I, I'm sure we will try a little bit to explore um, now. 